Let's close our eyes for prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our Bible study. We thank you because of the way we come every time. And we come with a heart of joy and praise and gladness before you. We thank you, Lord, because an hour in your presence, two hours in your presence, is a very great time that actually helps us to be able to live the rest of our lives of joy and happiness from the presence of the Lord. We're asking today, Lord, that as we go into your word, you grant us the joy of learning again and they also the privilege of practicing your word so that we'll be better Christians and better leaders and better ministers and better children of God in Jesus name. We are praying, O oh Lord, that your spirit will breathe upon this word and enlighten us and grant us, Lord, the grace to be obedient to your word in Jesus name. We well, thank you because we belong to you. And we're looking at some people today that also belong to you. And their lives will challenge us and motivate us to be better in the service of the Lord and in the ministry as well. Lord, we pray that today our coming will not be in vain. But this study will profit and benefit every one of us tremendously. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I welcome you to the Bible study today. Uh, we are studying something very relevant uh, to our lives in the book of Revelation today. Even though we are in the midst now in the study of the great tribulation. And yet the Lord is giving us like a window, like an open door. To get away a little from the sufferings and the pain and the panic and the pressure. That will be happening at the time of the great tribulation. And it makes us to see some people. The people that are righteous and holy. The people that actually are different from the rest of the people in the time of the great tribulation. That's why today's study is a kind of happy study, joyful study. That actually shall impact our lives and make us better believers. Even though these are the people that will be living at the time of the great tribulation. We're looking at Revelation chapter 14. And I'm looking at it from verse 1 all through to verse 5. Revelation chapter 14 from verse 1. As you open your Bible, please follow along as I read. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion. And we see him and hundred forty and four thousand, forty and hundred and hundred and forty four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard the voice from heaven. As the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and a song as it were a new song, therefore before the throne, and before the four beasts, and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. And they, these are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, be, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no girl, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Here we find uh, these people that uh, we're, we're referring to them as triumphant saints. Actually, they're Jewish people. And we're told they are standing on the mountain of Zion. And they are standing with the Lamb of God, with the Lord Jesus Christ. Here in this first part of chapter 14, the curtain is drawn aside to reveal the state and the status and the standing of these 144,000 redeemed Jews who were saved and sealed in chapter 7. If you will remember, we studied already in chapter 7 that each of the 12 tribes that are mentioned there, 12,000 people were sealed. And when you multiply 12 by 12,000, you are going to have 144,000. These are amazing, amazing people, marvelous people, an extraordinary people, an amazing group of 144,000 saints who will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord during the Great Tribulation. Here we see them standing, standing triumphantly with the conquering Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ on Mount Zion. And what a glorious sight will that be? It's like, think about it this way. It's like you pick an Enoch in a corrupt generation and then you multiply that by 144,000. 
144,000 people like Enoch just walking with the Lord and staying with the Lord and living with the Lord with no blemish and no sin in their lives. Or maybe like you're picking that man Noah, perfect in his generation, in the midst of imperfection, in the midst of corruption, in the midst of all the pollutions around him, he stood right. And then God said, you have I found blameless and just before me in this generation. Multiply that by 144,000 and just some people that are pure and righteous and holy without any blemish or fault in their lives at the time of the great tribulation what a sight that will be or maybe it's we're thinking about Samuel and you pick up Dan, uh, Samuel that lived in Shiloh with Eli and at that time even Dophna and Phineas were very bad and corrupt and polluted and sinful and they were very very bad and it's like it was nothing good in them that's what will happen in the time of the great tribulation at the time of the great tribulation you'll find the majority of the people they'll be sinful they'll be corrupt they'll be bad they'll be evil and yet you'll find these 144,000 people in the midst of imperfection in the midst of corruption they'll be living perfect life righteous life pure lives sanctified lives and they'll be sealed or maybe we'll pick up Daniel in Babylon and as you look at Daniel in Babylon, you will see there was no fault in him. He was righteous. When you multiply that by 144,000, a group like that had never lived. Even at the best times of the children of Israel in their nation, in their history, we have never found such a group of people, so many thousands, no fault, no blame, no sin, no backsliding, no lukewarmness, no prayerlessness in their lives, all pure and righteous and holy. That's what will happen at that time. And here we see this beautiful and glorious scene. Now, as you look at chapter 14, you'll find that it's like a contrast between, uh, from, between chapter 14 and chapter 13. We already studied chapter 13. What did you find in chapter 13? It's a picture of gloom, a picture of darkness, a picture of Satan, a picture of the beast, a picture of the Antichrist, a picture of the false prophet. You come to chapter 14, you see something different. There's a picture of God and of the Lamb and of Christ, and of the saints, and of the pure, and of the holy, and of the light, and of the kingdom of God. Therefore you find there is a contrast between chapter 13 and chapter 14. Here you have the beautiful scene of the glorious ones who serve the Lord. But there in chapter 13 you have the description of the vile sinful ones that serve Satan and they worship the beast, the Antichrist. Over there in chapter 13 we see Satan. Over here we see God and Christ. Over there in chapter 13, we see the Antichrist. Over here in chapter 14, it's Christ. Over there, we see the false prophet. But over here, we see the angels of God and the redeemed saints that are pure and holy. Over there in chapter 13, it's deception. Over here in chapter 14, it is truth. Over there in chapter 13 is the mark of the beast. But over here, it is genuine worship. And the mark of God, the seal of God, upon the forehead of these 144,000 saints of God that are rejoicing with the Lord, their Redeemer. Over there in chapter 13, we see wickedness. Over here, we see righteousness. Over there, we see corruption. Here, we see purity. Over there, we see, over there, we see blasphemy. You see the blasphemy in chapter 13. As you come to chapter 14, there's no blasphemy here. There is praise. There's two worship. Over there, we see idolatry. But over here, we see righteousness and purity. Over there, we see the false uh, prophet uh, that is a false counterfeit lamb. Here is the true lamb of God standing triumphant on the Mount of Zion. And over there, we see damnation and perdition. But over here, we see glory. And we see the triumph of those who are marked with the seal of God upon their heads. That's the reason we're studying this. And I want to tell you, if it is possible for these people at the time of the Great Tribulation to live a righteous life and to live a pure life, it is possible today. We're not in the Great Tribulation yet. And the problems we see today, the persecutions we see today, the trials we see today, they are nothing to be compared with the time of the Great Tribulation. And therefore, that's the reason we believe that today, number one, it is possible to be saved in a sinful society saved in a sinful society as you look at these 144,000 saints of god jewish people righteous people they were saved 
in a sinful society as bad as sinful as corrupt as polluted as evil that generation will be you'll find these people that are saved and sealed by the lord number two sanctified in a corrupt society and although the site is corrupt and everything you see around us as you look at the civil servants as you look at the places of work as you look at the streets you say this is corruption and there's no corruption to be compared with this in the generations of men it looks like evil men are waxing worse and worse they are more corrupt every day and yet if these people want for the four thousand redeemed jews could be sanctified at their own time in the time of the great tribulation i dare tell you that it is possible today to be sanctified in our corrupt society number three they were holy they will be holy in the most horrible place the, the most horrible place and the most horrible time will be the time of the great tribulation and though the condition will be horrible yet they will be holy i want to tell you then that no matter where you're living in a village or in the town in a school or anywhere even if the place is horrible the most horrible place in your country you can still live a holy life a challenging life because the power of the blood of the lamb can make us holy and saved and sanctified and pure and I'm, I'm poor and righteous, holy, in the most horrible place. Number four, uncompromising under unlimited persecution. As we look at the persecution and the pressure, at the time of the great tribulation, it's almost like it's unlimited. It's almost like there's no gauge. And the persecution will continue. It's indescribable. And yet you find these people that will be following the Lord. 144,000 says uncompromising in unlimited or under unlimited persecution. That's the reason we believe today. You can't say, well, it's my persecution. It's the pressure upon me. It's the opposition I have. It's the trials I have. The people will not leave me will not leave me alone and allow me to live a righteous life that's why i'm not able to live an uncompromising life yes you can the grace of god is sufficient for every one of us if these people 144,000 jews will be able to live uncompromising in that period of unlimited persecution today we can number five they were try they will be triumphant during the tribulation period tribulation trouble trial testing whatever it is all the same we can be triumphant and we can sing with the redeemed of the lord and we can shout with the apostle paul in all these things were more than conquerors through him that loved us and gave himself for us triumphant because glory be to god that gives us the victory and makes us triumphant every time the weakness of the of the human nature you can be triumphant over that the temptations that come upon you you can be triumphant over that the problems of life that challenging your families you can be triumphant over that if these 144,000 Jews can be triumphant in their own time there is nothing happening today there is no persecution no oppression and no tribulation today that is up to 100 1 over 100 of what will be happening at that time and if they can be triumphant praise the Lord we will be triumphant in Jesus name they were sealed in a suffering society. Hey, look at the suffering of the great tribulation, earthquake and volcanoes and the sun becoming dark and the moon becoming blood and everybody running up uh, elter skelter, wars and rumors of wars and killing one another and part of the rivers becoming blood and the one would drop in into the water, they can't drink because it's bitter. In all that suffering in that society, they'll be the sealed people. God will separate them, set them apart and seal them and say, these are mine. And he'll put the mark of ownership upon them. That's the reason we know that in the time in which we are living today, look at this example of these people that will be living at the time of the great tribulation. And if at that time of the suffering, they will still be sealed, then we can have seal of, of the Lord upon us today. Number seven, protected from the power of the beast. Protected from the power of the beast. That means today, if they will be protected at that time, and I'm telling you that the manifestation of the power of the beast, of the antichrist, of the dragon and of Satan, at at that time of the great tribulation the, the devil will not have manifested his evil power like that before in the whole of the generations of men because he knows he has a short time and if these people will be protected from the power of the antichrist and the power of the dragon and the power of the beast at that time then the people of god today they can be protected as well that's why we have confidence in the lord and we're not looking at the things that we see at the things that we hear at the news coming into our ears and saying well 
it looks like today it's very difficult to live the Christian life because what can you do? Look at this condition, look at this condition, look at that condition. We can be triumphant and we're going to be triumphant in Jesus' name. If God will do this that we're reading now at that time, what will God do at that time? God can do the same today. Even if we're living in the most difficult time and in the most dangerous time, in the most horrible place, the Lord himself in his power, in his authority, he can make us triumphant and he can make us victorious and will be more than conquerors in Jesus' name. The word of God says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And because the greater one lives in us and his word lives in us and his grace and power and his spirit lives within us. Because of that, we know that we're going to be triumphant. And no matter the temptation, no matter the trial, no matter the compromise all around us, ours is a victory because we belong to the Lord and the Lord belongs to us. The victory that he will give these people at that time, he will give us even today and he'll keep us faithful and righteous and sanctified and holy until the time of the, of the rapture and we will make it to the saints and redeemed of the Lord to go away in the rapture to heaven in Jesus name. Today we're looking at this study, the Lamb and 144,000 triumphant saints. The Lamb, that's the Lord Jesus Christ and 144,000 triumphant saints. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, separated, sealed people with the Redeemer. Separated, sealed people with the Redeemer. Number two, special song of praise by the redeemed. Special song of praise by the redeemed. Number three, sanctification and purity of the redeemed the sanctification and the purity of the redeemed i come back to number one separated sealed people with the redeemer i look at revelation chapter 14 verse 1 revelation chapter 14 verse 1 and i look and lo a lamb stood on mount zion and with him and hundred forty and four thousand having his father's name written in their foreheads there we find the description, the introduction to what we're looking at today. Number one, we see the Lamb. And then two, we see the redeemed of the Lord with their Redeemer. John the Beloved said, I look, and lo, I see a Lamb, and he's standing on Mount Zion. And with him then I also saw the people I saw before in chapter 7. I saw them where they were was being sealed. Now I see them, 144,000 people. And they were having the Father's name written in their forehead in the darkest of times. Though the, through the most difficult period in history, God is able to save sinners and is able to make them triumphant saints, triumphant over all forms of evil and all forms of sin. During this great tribulation, these 144,000 Jews says will face the greatest danger ever known to man. And yet they will stand true and they will stand faithful and they will stand uncompromising and triumphant. He said, I looked, John's eyes were turned away from the beast of chapter 13. Turned away from the image of the beast in chapter 13. And his eyes are turned to the triumph and to the victory. And to the conquering Christ, the Lamb of God on Mount Zion, the Lamb stood in authority and he stood in power. He stood glorious and triumphant as the reigning king, the sovereign Lord. He said the Lamb stood on Mount Zion, the seat of all authority and the pinnacle of glory, the dwelling place of God, the place of ultimate glory and victory and triumph. Hey, let's look at uh, the passages that talk about the Lamb of God. We've seen some of these uh, passages before. Let's go over them again. In uh, Revelation chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 6. Revelation chapter 5, I'm looking at verse 6. In Revelation chapter 5 verse 6, here we have an introduction to the Lamb. It says, And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a Lamb. A seed had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty-four el and, and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them halves and golden vials 
full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And he sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and, uh, and hast redeemed us to God, and by thy blood out of every kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation, and hast made us unto our God, kings, and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Uh, you see that uh, when he had taken the book, we studied that before, that's the title deed of the whole universe of the whole world. When he took uh, that book, then we know that uh, the 24 elders representing the whole church raptured already and in heaven. And then the angels too, the living creatures, they fell down before the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And they worshipped him and they said, you are worthy to take the book because he was the highest one and he's still the highest one in the whole universe. He's sitting on the right hand of majesty on high. But the praise of the Lamb did not stop there. As we look at chapter 7, reading from verse 9. Chapter 7 from verse 9. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number. Of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb. Clothes were white robes and palms in their hands. These again are people that are redeemed. Their sins are washed away. They too they had been saved in the most difficult times. And from the most horrible place. They have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And it says, and cried with a loud voice in verse 10, saying, Salvation to our God, which seated upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and four bees, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto God forever and ever. And everybody said, Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And from where, and whence came they? And I said, I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And you will see that uh, at this time now we can be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And even at that time too, those who will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ any time, any day, if they will make the effort to believe, they too they will be washed in the blood of the Lamb. In chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 11. Revelation chapter 12 verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. It's the Lamb all the time. The Lamb. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. It tells us in chapter 15 verses 3 and 4. Chapter 15 verses 3 and 4. It tells us and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God and the song of the lamb they sang the song of the lamb saying great and marvelous are thy works lord god almighty just and true are thy ways thou king of saints who shall not fear thee O lord and glorify thy name for thou only art holy for all nations shall come and worship before thee for thy judgments are made manifest chapter 17 of revelation verse 14 it tells us say and these shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is the lord of lords and king of kings and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful you will see the revelation of the lamb in fact uh, you must remember that john the beloved that was receiving this revelation he had known the lord jesus christ and he had known when john the baptist pointed him out and said behold the lamb of god that taketh away the sin of the world that's how he recognized him he said in chapter 5 he said i saw him and then i saw that this is that lamb but the lamb now something has happened he was slain but now he's standing he has risen from the dead not only that, he has become the lion of the tribe of Judah. Not only that, he's now standing on Mount Zion. Not only that, the redeemed of the Lord are with him. And then as he goes on in the revelation, in the progressive revelation of the land, he saw him eventually as a king of kings and the Lord of lords. I used one word now, I don't want you to forget, progressive revelation concerning the land. Let me go over, go over each with you. Number one, the slain lamb. Number two, the standing lamb. Number three, the strong lamb. Number four, the supreme lamb. 
Number five, the saving sanctifying lamb. Number six, the song celebrated lamb. And then number seven, the sovereign reigning lamb. As he looked at the lamb in chapter five, he said, I saw him. It was as if he had been slain, crucified for you and for me, the lamb slain. And then he said, but I also see him standing. He had risen from the dead and he dies no more. He is standing and he's standing as somebody with authority and power because he had risen from the dead. Number one, slain. Number two, standing. Number three, strong. And it's, and it's told him in chapter 5 verse 5 And one of the elders says unto me Weep not, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah The root of David has prevailed to open the book And to loose the seven seals thereof As strong as a lion Now is a strong lamb But then he tells us in chapter 7 and verse 19 Of uh, this uh, in the uh, Chapter 7, as you look at verse 9, it says, After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, and before the throne, and before the Lamb. That is, is now near the throne. And is a wonder as is in the midst of the throne. Verse 17, the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. It's not the supreme one, the supreme Lamb, but it saves and he sanctifies and he purifies in verse 14 of that chapter 7 and i said unto him sir thou knowest and he said unto me these are they in which came out of the great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb he saves and he sanctifies but now we're singing unto him is a celebrated lamb and is a song lamb that is the lamb that all of heaven and all of us that they are singing to the song of the lamb the song of the Redeemer and the celebration and the worship of the Lamb as we sing a new song, the song of Moses and the, sing of the song of the Redeemer, the song of the Lamb. In chapter 15, I'm looking at verses 3 and 4. Chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, it says, And they sing, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the lamb now it is time to celebrate and to sing the song of the lamb but eventually is the supreme one the reigning one the sovereign one the one that is the king of kings and the lord of lords and his name is the king of kings and the lord of lords and as john saw this progressive revelation concerning the lord jesus christ the lamb of god he must be worshiping his own heart to even though it was a revelation unto him and this is said this is the lamb that saves us and the lamb that sanctifies us and the lamb that makes us holy and the lamb that makes us righteous is a spotless sinless lamb of god in first peter chapter one first peter chapter one i'm reading to you from verses 18 and 19 first peter chapter one verse 18 for as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but for the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's the lamb. Let's come back to Revelation chapter 14. As we're looking at the people with the Redeemer, that is the 144,000 Jews that are saved and sanctified, set apart, sealed unto the Lord separated sealed people with the redeemer i will look at this verse one again chapter 14 verse one and i look and lo a lamb stood on the mount zion and with him an hundred and forty and four thousand having his father's name written in their foreheads this is talking about uh, you know these jewish people that were spoken about before these are redeemed they are saved, they are purified, they are sanctified, they are triumphant saints from the 12 tribes of Israel, sealed and set apart for God during the great tribulation. Here we see these 144,000 overcomers in their future glory standing with the Lamb on Mount Zion. Uh, before I go on to tell you uh, more about uh, these uh, remnant of the children of Israel, these saved and sanctified and purified and transformed people, let me talk about the Mount Zion a little bit. 
as you look at uh, the scriptures in the Old Testament, actually many, many passages, but I'm going to just read some few from the Psalms. In Psalm 2, I'm reading to you from verses 2 and 3. Psalm 2. Let us look, sorry, uh, Psalm 2 from verse 6 and verse 7. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has, the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. You will see here as we are reading in chapter 14 now of Revelation. Here is a fulfillment. The Lamb standing on Mount Zion. And Almighty God said, I've set my son. I've set that king, the son, the Lamb of God, upon my holy hill of Zion. And I will declare unto him, you are my begotten beloved son, this day have I begotten you. In Psalm 9, I'm looking at verse 11. Psalm 9, verse 11. Sing praises unto the Lord, which dwelt in Zion, declare among the people is doing. That's exactly what you're reading about in Revelation chapter 14. As the redeemed of the Lord, these purified, sanctified saints, as they are singing unto the Lamb, and they're singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Here it says, sing praises to the Lord that dwelleth in Zion. That means then Zion, the seat of authority, is the dwelling place of God, the pinnacle of glory, the place of ultimate triumph. I'm looking at Psalm 48. In Psalm 48, we're looking at it from verse 1, talking about Zion, that dwelling place of God, that glorious place. In Psalm 48, verse 1, great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. On the side of the north, the city of the great king. So then we learn that uh, this Zion is a city of the great king. Psalm 76, verses 1 and 2. In Psalm 76, verses 1 and 2, still learning more about uh, this Zion, it tells us in Judah is God known. His name is great in Israel. His Salem also is his tabernacle, his dwelling place in Zion. Chapter 99. Psalm 99. Psalm 99, I'm reading again from verse 1. In Psalm 99, verse 1, the Lord reigneth. Let the people tremble. He seated between the cherubims. Let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion and is high above all the people. Let them praise thy, the, thy great and terrible name, for it is holy. That tells you about Zion. And you know, at the end of time, at the end of this world, at the time of the great tribulation, when everything is about to be wound up all the affairs of men about to be rounded up then the lord jesus christ as lord and king the lamb he will appear on mount zion that will be at the time of the great tribulation as the great tribulation is about to run to an end in joel chapter 3 verse 15 Joel chapter 3 verse 15 The sun and the moon shall be darkened Already you know that's the time of the great tribulation And the stars shall withdraw their shining The Lord also shall roar out of Zion And utter his voice from Jerusalem And the heavens and the earth shall shake But the Lord will be the hope of his people And the strength of the children of Israel So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God Dwelling in Zion on my holy mountain then shall jerusalem be holy and there shall be no strange there shall no strangers pass through her anymore well then the time we are now in the study in the book of revelation that is revelation chapter 14 we see the lord jesus christ as a lamb and he's standing on mount zion and the victorious righteous purified triumphant one forty four thousand jews are standing with him there because john said and i looked and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Actually, this will be the fulfillment of the expectation of the children of Israel for a long time. The children of Israel at this very time now, they have rejected the Messiah. They have rejected the Lord. But the time is coming when they will accept the Messiah. They will accept the Lord. And at that time as they accept the Lord, 144,000 of them will be sealed and be protected from all 
all the persecution and all the destruction and all the carnage and all those evil things that will take place at the time of the great tribulation we're told in romans chapter 11 romans chapter 11 reading from verse 26 so and so all israel shall be saved as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. It says, All Israel shall be saved. You ask me, the 144,000 Jewish people standing with the Lord Jesus Christ on Mount Zion, are they the, all the 120, all the whole of Israel that will be saved? No, they are the first fruit. They are the first fruit. In fact, as we read on, you are going to discover that's exactly what they are called. The first fruits. Please turn your Bible. I'm still coming back to Romans. But uh, turn your Bible to Revelation chapter 14 again. Revelation chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 4 now. These are they which are not defiled with women. For they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. These were redeemed from among men. The 144,000 Jews being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. The first fruits. This is like uh, when you are harvesting and then you bring in the first set of crops. That's the first fruit. And you're still going back. You're still going to harvest the rest. The children of Israel, a lot of them are going to be saved during the great tribulation. But these 144,000 saved, select, saved and uh, sealed the Jews, they are the first fruits. Please turn your Bible to Romans chapter 11 verse 16. In Romans chapter 11 verse 16, For if the first fruits be holy, that is, if uh, these 144,000 Jews are sanctified and pure and sealed, and if they be holy, spotless, without any sin, if the first fruits be holy, the lump also is holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. It's telling us that these 144,000 Jews, just the first fruits, they are holy. They are righteous. And then the rest of the Jews too, as these 144,000 will be witnessing to them. And they will see the power, the protection, the presence of God in their lives. They too, they will yield themselves to the Lord. In Romans chapter 11 verse 27, for this is my Verse 27, chapter 11. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sin. It tells us in um, Revelation chapter 7, talking about uh, these 144,000, just to refresh your memory, to remind you, because we've studied about them before. It tells us in chapter 7, Revelation verse 3. Chapter 7, verse 3, saying, Hot not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. And I had the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And then it goes on from verse 5, of the tribe of Judah, twelve thousand, of the tribe of Reuben, twelve thousand, and of the tribe of Gad, twelve thousand. It goes on in verses of the tribe of Asa, uh, it was sealed, seven, twelve thousand, and of the tribe of Naphtali was sealed, twelve thousand, of the tribe of Manasseh was sealed, twelve thousand, of the tribe of Simeon was sealed, twelve thousand, and of the tribe of Levi was sealed, twelve thousand, of the tribe of Issachar was sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Zebulon was sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Joseph was sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Benjamin was sealed 12,000 and then it goes on after this I beheld a great multitude that no man can number so then you will see that these 144,000 they were from the 12 tribes of the children of Israel and these are holy and these are righteous I pray that as they will be able to have the grace of God at their own time in our own time we too will have the grace of God. I said we'll have the grace of God. And as they are the seal of God upon them, we too by the grace of God, the Spirit of God will seal us today. Will pray, will protect us as well. That as they will escape all the troubles and the trials of that time, all the troubles and trials of this time to God will make us overcomers in Jesus' name. We come back to Revelation chapter 14. What do we find them doing here? They were singing special song of praise by the Redeemer. Special song of praise by the redeemed. By the redeemed. We come to Revelation chapter 14 verses 2 and 3. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder and i heard the voice of harpers happening with their hearts and a song as it were a new song 
before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders and no man could learn no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth john the beloved said i, I saw something and i heard something and it's a great song and it's like a thunder a voice a sound so loud like the roaring of the ocean and as the, as loud as the sounding of the thunder the loud sound came out in sweet instrumental music from the halves of the redeemed company and think about uh, instrumentalists 144,000 and think about it when you think about that think of uh, you know the, the church service over here if this place is filled up and the outside is, is filled up and you multiply that multiply that multiply that by many many numbers and then you have 144,000 and every one of those 144,000 a great multitude indeed purified people sanctified people set apart people they have instruments of music in their hand halves that they can play and all the 144,000 redeemed souls, redeemed saints, and these are Jewish people, they have halves in their hand. Every one of them can play very well on the harp. And this great multitude, they are playing and singing at the same time. Because it says they sang a new song. And as they sang uh, this new song, it came out so loud. It, it was a swelling kind of sound that came out so loud as the sound of many waters and as the sound of thunder. Yet, it was not just a tumultuous, a deafening, terrifying shout. You know, even, the, even those of us who are here, not up to 144,000, if we begin to sing and all of us are playing instrument, it will be so loud that you think, what are we playing? Why don't we reduce the orchestra and the choir? But this one will be so harmonious. It will be like a symphonious half, and the music of heaven, elevated and just, will be so sweet and harmonious and beautiful and solemn at the same time. And it's going to be a glorious sight. I pray that when the song of heaven will be there, after they have finished their own, then we'll sing our own. We will sing forever and ever to the Lord. It will be wonderful in Jesus' name. It says the song as it were a new song before the throne. And it is the new song of celebration. The celebration of their complete redemption in final triumph over all foes before the throne of God in heaven. And then it says something here. It says, and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth only this special group of saved sanctified sealed saints will be able to sing that special song of praise and joy and triumph to their redeemer to their king and to their lord it's a special song and it's a special time and it's a specially selected people and these people are one forty four thousand jews and let's see the singing as we have been reading the book of revelation we'll be seen singing uh, right uh, from the beginning of uh, introduction after the church has been raptured and taken to heaven in uh, revelation chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 8 revelation chapter 5 verse 8 and when he had taken the book the four and the, the, the four bees and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb having every one of them halves and golden vials full of odors which are the prayers of the saints you remember when we studied this revelation chapter 5 we pointed out at that time that the 24 elders actually represent the redeemed souls the church that have been raptured and now they're in the presence of god before the throne of god in heaven in verse 9 it says and they sung a new song saying thou art worthy to take the to take the book and to open the seals thereof for thou was thou was slain and hast redeemed us to god by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our god kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth that shows that the redeemed of the lord and it says we shall reign on the earth the point is we will all have halves musical instrument and then we'll all sing unto the lord and unto the lamb as we look at revelation chapter 15 revelation chapter 15 i am looking at it from verse 2 it says and i saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having halves of god 
Do you see everywhere you turn, whether you are reading chapter 5, or you are reading chapter 14, or you come to chapter 15, you see them having harps in their hands, musical instruments in their hands. And it says in verse 3, and they sing the song of Moses, the, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. They sing also the song of the Lamb. That's of the Lord Jesus Christ. In this uh, chapter 15 now, we're not just thinking about the 144,000. We're thinking of the redeemed of the Lord all over. From all nations and from all tongues and from all kindreds. And they sing the song of the Lamb. Saying, great and marvelous are thy works, O Lord, God Almighty, just and true. Are thy ways, thou King of saves and as we think about uh, singing when we get to heaven i pray you'll be there i said i pray you'll be there uh, you know uh, there's a kind of song you are going to sing that even the angels will not be able to sing uh, with you uh, because you see they do not know about jesus christ being the lamb being redeemed because you see it's redeemed of the lord that can say you have redeemed us by thy blood and from all the kindreds of the earth and from all tongues and from all people you have redeemed us and because you have redeemed us that is why we can sing unto you and let me read one song to one song unto you there is singing up in heaven such as we have never known where the angels sing the praises of the lamb upon the throne the sweet hearts are never tuneful are ever tune tuneful and their voices always clear oh that we might be more like them while we serve the master here it says but i hear another anthem and it's blending voices clear and strong unto him who has redeemed us and has brought us bought us uh, is the song we have come through tribulation relations to this land so fair and so bright and then it says in the fountain freely flowing he has made our garments white then the angels stand and listen for they cannot join that song like the sound of many waters by that happy blood washed throng for they sing about the great trials and battles fought and victories won. And they praise their great Redeemer who has said unto them, Well done. So, although I'm not an angel, yet I know that over there, I will join a blessed chorus that angels cannot share. I will sing about my Savior. Upon who upon that Calvary freely pardoned my transgression and died to set a sinner free. Holy, holy is what the angels sing. And I expect to help them make the courts of heaven ring. But when I sing redemption story, angels will fold their wings. For angels never felt the joy that our salvation brings. That's in our songbook. Uh, that's gospel hymns and songs number 142. Holy, holy is what the angels sing. And I'm expecting to help them make the courts of heaven ring. But when I sing redemption story, angels will fold their wings. Because angels never felt the joys that our salvation brings. We shall sing over there. I said we shall sing over there. It will be the song of praise. It will be the song of redemption. It will be the song of deliverance. I'm looking at some 32. In Psalm 32, we're looking at verse 7. In Psalm 32, verse 7, it tells us what kind of song we have down here and what kind of song we're going to have up there when we eventually get there. Psalm 32, I'm looking at verse 7. It tells us, Thou art my hiding place, thou shalt preserve me from trouble, thou hast shall compass me about with songs of deliverance compass me about with songs of deliverance it tells us in chapter 33 that he is some 33 verse 1 rejoice in the lord who ye righteous for praise is comely for the upright praise the lord with half sing unto him with the subtree and an instrument of ten strings sing unto him a new song and play skillfully with a loud noise 
Do you see this? It tells us to play, to play instrument. And it says, We shall sing and make a loud noise unto the Lord in verse 4. It says, For the Lord, uh, for the word of the Lord is right. And all his works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as an heap. He layeth up the dead in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe, in reverence, in honor of him. For he spake, and it was done. And he commanded, and he stood fast. Then he tells us in verse 10, the Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught, and he maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord that shall stand forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he has chosen for, he, for his own inheritance. And that's the kind of song we all to sing, celebrating the joy we have in the Lord. Celebrating the happiness we have in the Lord. Celebrating the redemption that the Lord has given us. In Psalm 40, I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 40 verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he climbed unto me, and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of the horrible pit, out of the murray clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And he, and he has put a new song in my mouth. When you are saved, there's a new song in your mouth. When you are healed, there's a new song in your mouth. When you're redeemed, you are redeemed from the curse of the law. There is a new song in your mouth. When the Lord has turned away your captivity, there's the joy of the Lord in your heart and the song of redemption in your mouth. He has put a new song in my mouth. Even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. In Psalm 35, in Psalm 35, when we eventually cross over Jordan and we cross to the land of Canaan, and we are able to now walk on those streets of gold will be singing unto the Lord as well in Isaiah chapter 35 reading from verse 8 and it says an highway shall be there and a way and it shall be called the way of holiness the unclean shall not pass over it but it shall be for those the wayfaring men no fool shall not err therein no lion shall be there nor any ravenous beast shall go up therein, thereon it shall not be found there there, but the redeemed shall walk there and that's what we're reading about now as we come to the book of revelation and we're redeemed and then we're taken away from this earth either we're taken away in rapture or the people those jewish people that will go through the great tribulation and then they'll believe on the lord at the time of the great tribulation and they're also redeemed by the blood of the lamb and they will sing unto the lord it says but the redeemed of the lord shall be there and the ransomed of the lord in essential return and come to zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sign shall flee away Isaiah chapter 51 I'm reading from verse 11 Isaiah chapter 51 reading from verse 11 therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their head and it shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away here is the expectation of the people of God and I pray that at that time you'll be there I said you'll be there there'll be number one a new song number two there'll be a notable song number three there will be a never-ending song a new song every experience we have ushers us into a new song when you are saved and you are newly saved the song of redemption comes in your mouth and when you are sanctified and you begin to sing holiness unto the lord it's a watch word and song there is a new song in your mouth and when you are baptized in the holy ghost and then you know they shall cast out evil spirits by his power and he gives you that new song the song of power and the song of authority every new experience you get in the lord ushers you into new celebration and joy and singing unto the lord and it's going to be the newest of all experiences when we cross over the line. 
and we pass over from this earth and we get into heaven you get into heaven like this and already the people before you that got there before you they are singing already and you meet a chorus of singing and nobody will teach you immediately you just know and recognize the song and you begin to sing with them a new song a notable song a never ending song and will be joyful and happy in the presence of the Lord forever and ever I pray that will be there in Jesus name I come to point number three sanctification and purity of the redeemed the sanctification and the purity of the redeemed we'll come to Revelation chapter 14 and we're not looking at uh, verses 4 and 5 Revelation chapter 14 I'm reading from verse 4 it says these are they which were not defiled with women for they are virgins these are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. These are the redeemed of the Lord, and you can see the, uh, the reason why the Lord selected them. The reason why the Lord chose them. The reason why the Lord sealed them and protected them. These 144,000 sealed servants of God were not chosen arbitrarily. They were not selected arbitrarily. They are known unto God. And what did God know about them? Number one, not defiled. Number two, they were virgins. Number three, they follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. Number four, they are the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Number five, they are redeemed. And there was no guile in their mouth. Number six, then number seven, they are without fault before the throne of God. And these are the very qualities that the Lord is expecting in the lives of the people that belong to the Lord today. And these, all these characteristics, when you are saved, when you are sanctified, when you are made holy, when you are purified, these are the characteristics expected in your life. You are washed in the blood of the Lamb. And because you are washed in the blood of the Lamb, the power in that blood of the Lamb today can make you so clean and so pure that you too, number one, you will be undefiled. Number two, you'll be a spiritual virgin. Number three, you'll be following the Lord everywhere he goes. That is, you'll be a faithful, true disciple of the Lord. Then you'll be one of the false fruits that is to take part in the rapture. And you'll be part of the false fruits that will be to the Lord and to the Lamb. You'll be the redeemed of the Lord. In your mouth, there'll be no lie. There'll be no deception. There'll be no girl. Number six, you'll be without fault before the throne of God because the Lord has taken your faults away and he sanctifies and purifies and perfects you. And let's look at these uh, characteristics one by one in chapter 14 of Revelation chapter 4. It says, these are they which are not defiled, not defiled with women. When the Lord Jesus Christ was on earth, he described the qualification of the people that actually will be following the Lord. And he showed the characteristics of the people. And then he tells us that there will be no defilement. And then he describes the things that actually defile people. The things that defile people. And when we come to the Lord, he cleanses all these things away from our lives. In Mark chapter 7 verse, from verse 14. Mark chapter 7 verse 14. And when he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand, there is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. Then he says, But the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile the man. If any man have ears, let him hear. And then we're told in verse 17, when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he said unto them, are ye, are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever sin, and whatsoever sin from without entereth into the man cannot defile him, because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the drudge, purging all meat, and he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. From within, out of the heart of man, proceed, number one, evil thoughts, two, adulteries, three, fornications, four, murders, five, thefts, six, covetousness, seven, wickedness, eight, deceit, nine, lasciviousness, ten, an evil eye, eleven, blasphemy, 
12 pride, 13 foolishness, all these evil things come from within and they defile the man. And the people we're studying about today, all these things have been cleansed away from their lives, not defiled. That's what the Lord is expecting from you and from me today, that you'll be so washed and so cleansed in the blood of the Lamb that you will not be defiled. There'll be no defilement in your life anymore. Adultery, fornication, covetousness, blasphemy, evil eye, lasciviousness, all those things will not be there anymore. You are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. In fact, we are told in Revelation chapter 21 verse 27. Revelation chapter 21, reading from verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Mark it. Here is the word of the Lord. There shall be nothing defiling that you ever enter into heaven. If you have not been saved, if you have not been cleansed, if your sins have not been washed away, if adultery is still there, fornication is still there, covetousness is still there, if uh, deceit, deception, hypocrisy is still there, there's no way you can get to heaven with all those defilements. Because it says, And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever walketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are reaching in the the Lamb's book of life and the people in the book of life are the people that are actually washed and cleansed and purged and purified and sanctified from their sins number two as we look at Revelation chapter 14 verse 4 these are they which were not defiled with women for they are virgins they are virgins the Lord expects that those who are calling upon the Lord will be like a spiritual virgins, not defiled with anything unclean, anything that's abomination in the presence of the Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have, have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That's what the Lord is expecting, that you'll be a spiritual virgin. And that all impurity will not be in your life, in, in uncleanness will not be in your life. That you are totally washed and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. That I may present you chaste virgin before the Lord Jesus Christ. Come back to Revelation chapter 14 and in verse 4. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. That means that uh, these people are true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are faithful disciples. Disciples. They are following his examples in all things, following the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. And they are obeying his instructions in everything. They are yielding to his laws and following his guidance, be it in pleasant paths or rough roads. When the Lord directs us, when the Lord instructs us, whether it is pleasant or it's a little bit difficult and tough, we we'll still follow because we are the faithful disciples of the Lord. Look at Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. Revelation chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and it, but the Lamb shall and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful those are the people following the lord they're following the lamb and it says they are called they're faithful and they are chosen let's let's come back to revelation chapter 14 and in verse 4 after he has told us that they are and they are the people that are following the lamb everywhere he goes he says these are the redeemed from among men redeemed from among men uh, the, the people today who are following the lord has the same characteristic the lord is expecting that you are redeemed by the blood of the lamb it tells us in first peter chapter one first peter chapter one i'm reading to you from verse 14 in uh, first peter chapter one verse 14 as obedient children not fashioning yourselves according to the former laws in your ignorance but as he which has called you is holy so be ye holy in all manner of conversation because it is written be ye holy for i am holy the lord is saying the reason you are to be holy the reason you are to be pure is that god himself is holy and god himself is pure and the lord jesus christ that you are following he is holy and he is pure then he tells us in verse 17 if ye call on the father who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work past the time of us sojourning here in fear for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition from your fathers 
but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He wants us to show that we have been cleansed in the blood of the lamb and that we are actually living lives that show that we are redeemed. We are the redeemed of God. I come back to Revelation chapter 14 now in verse 5. Because they would look at the latter part of verse 14 where it says, We are the first fruits unto the Lord. I've read that to you already in Romans chapter 11 and verse 16. Now we come to verse 5. In their mouth was no girl. In their mouth was found no girl. If there is anything the Lord is expecting from us, is that there will be no deception in our mouth. There will be no girl in our mouth. And when we say girl, girl means deception. It means lying. In uh, First Peter chapter three, First Peter chapter three, I'm reading from verse ten. First Peter chapter three, verse ten. For he that will love life and see good days, uh, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. If we're going to see life, and if we're going to be with the Lord eventually, if we're going to sing the song of redemption in heaven, if we're going to go with the redeemed of the Lord, when the rapture will take place, and we're going to live with God forever and ever in heaven, there should be no lie, no deception in our mouth. It says over here, it's leaves that they speak no girl. As we talk about a no girl, no deception, no lying. There, there are different forms of lying. Number one, a spoken lie. You know, lies that you speak out. God hates it. Number two, there's dramatized lie. You don't talk, you just dramatize it. You act it out. And it's a lie. God recognizes it, condemns it, and he judges it. Number three, there is corporate lie. Corporate lie where, you know, people join together and they agree together. What lie are we going to tell? What deception are we going to perpetrate? Say it this way. If they ask you, this is what you say. If they ask me, this is what I will say. We're united in this. Corporate lie. It happens at a time of courtship. It happens when we see the marriage committee. And we lose our souls and we lose our lives because of corporate lying that we agree to. Number four, jovial lies. I was playing. I was just trying to make you happy. Just trying to be funny, just trying to make you laugh. That's why I'm telling the lie. God condemns it. Jovial lies. Number five, habitual lies. Always there. Always telling the lie. And it's habitual. And that is the character. Habitual lies. God hates it. Number six, religious lie. It's a religion. Prophets of the Old Testament, they told religious lies. And some people who said they are working for God in the Bible times, they told religious lies. And God condemns religious lies. Number seven, professional lies. The lies we tell in the office. The lies we tell as civil servants. The lies we tell as salary earners. The lies we tell as a union of workers. Professional lies. Look at the word of God. In uh, Psalm, 100, um, uh, Psalm 101, I'm reading to you from verse 7. Psalm 101, I'm reading from verse 7. It says, He that walketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. Spoken lie, telling lies. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. If you are telling it, if you are speaking it out, God condemns it. And you will not dwell in the sight of the Lord. I told you that spoken lie, number two, is dramatized lie. That you don't even say a word at all. You don't even show up, but you dramatize it. And you act it out. In Genesis chapter 27. Genesis chapter 27. I'm reading to you from verse 6. In Genesis 27 verse 6. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob her son, saying, Behold, I had thy father speak unto Esau thy brother, saying, Bring me venison and make me savory meat, that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord, uh, before the Lord, um, before the Lord, before my dead. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock. 
and fetch me from thence two good kids of the goods, and I will make them sovereign meat for thy father, such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father, that he may eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. My father, peradventure, will feel me, and I shall seem to him as a deceiver, and I shall bring a curse upon me, and not a blessing and his mother said unto him upon me be thy cause my son only obey my voice and go fetch me then and he went and he fetched and brought them to his mother and his mother made savory meat and such such as his father loved and rebecca took good laid raiment of her eldest son esau which were with her in the house and put them upon jacob her son a younger son and she put the skin of the kids of the goats upon his sons upon the smooth of his neck and she gave the savory meat and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son jacob go to your father deceive him don't say anything just uh, the appearance will do the work they acted it out and you know that if you are dramatizing lies you are condemned number one spoken lies Number two, dramatized lies. And this is very common in society. This is very common among backsliders. This is very common among so-called believers. They don't know they are backsliding. And it's habitual with them to dramatize lies. They say, after I didn't say anything. You didn't say anything, but you acted it out. And when you act out a lie, people think that this is the thing. This is the fact. And it's a lie. And you are condemned in the sight of the Lord. If you die in that condition, you cannot get to heaven. I'm looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. Acts, chapter 5. I'm looking at verse 3. Corporate lie. Let's agree together. This is what I'm going to tell the apostles. If they ask you, tell them the same thing. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias... Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Why has Satan uh, filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? If you are telling lies, it's not God filling your heart. It's not the Holy Spirit directing you. It is not Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, our Lord, our Savior. The Holy One, the Righteous One that is influencing you. It's Satan that is influencing you. If you are telling lies and then eventually the wife came not knowing what had happened in verse 7 and it was about the space of three hours after when his wife not knowing what what was done came in and peter answered and said tell me whether you sold the land for so much she said yes yea for so much then peter said unto her how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the lord they agree together corporate line in the place of work do they do that and do you do that with them and you say well if the master asks us if the director uh, questions us if the leader asks us anything this is what to say and do you do that in the church too that if the coordinator asks me i'll tell him this make sure that if that same coordinator asks you this is exactly what you'll say coordinator group coordinators if the pastor asks you about this thing, this is what to say. If he calls me, this is what to say. And I know who he will call. I know the people he always calls. And then we go to him and we say, bro, please, uh, you know, don't let me lose my position in the church. I know that the pastor normally calls you. If he calls you, this is what to say. And then mention my name. And if he comes wanting to check up from me about it, this is exactly what I'll tell him. Corporate line. You agree together to tell a lie and it is of, of the devil and it is sin and it doesn't matter the position or the privilege or the office of that individual in the church of god lying is lying and god condemns it then about jovial lying and there are people that are so careless you wonder whether they are listening to any of these messages we're preaching every monday and every sunday and th their lives are just full of lies they tell lies to their wives they tell lies to their husbands they tell lies to you know members of the church they tell lies when they are playing they tell lies when they are serious they tell lies every time it has become the practice of their lives jovial lies are condemned of the lord 
in proverbs chapter 26 i'm reading from verse 18 and verse 19 in proverbs chapter 26 Proverbs 26, I'm reading to you from verse 18, as a madman who casteth firebrands and arrows and death. So you see that deceiveth his neighbor and said, I'm not, am I not in sport? Ah, my husband, you took that serious. I was just playing and you took me now to be a liar. Ah, my wife, that thing you asked me. Don't you remember the condition of that time when we were talking and we were smiling and laughing? I thought we were playing. That's why I just told you that. Ah, husband, you are joking and, and jesting with your wife with a lie. Dear sister, if you are still a sister, you are talking to your husband and you are telling lies. We don't joke with lies if we're children of God and then habitual liars. It's like, you know, the devil has nailed the coffin on them. And it's like they're irredeemable that, you know, the lies are just there and it is habitual. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 2. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And you come from a serious Bible study. And everybody prayed and cried before the Lord. And this uh, fellow was in the Bible study. And he go out of the Bible study and he starts his habitual line again. It's like the Bible study has no effect. The preaching, the message has no effect. There is no change. There is no transformation. There is no restoration from backsliding. There is no salvation. Because the conscience is seared with a hot iron. And liars will have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. Then religious lies. Do you remember the old prophet? And then the younger prophet had come and prophesied and worked some miracles. And his sons had told him, and he said, Saddle me the ass. And he, then he got to the young prophet and said, Are you the man that came from Bethlehem, Judah? Yes, I am. I then, well, the Lord has sent me to you. I saw an angel just now. And he told me to bring you back. And he brought him back. Then the Bible says, But he lied unto him. Religious lying. And there are some people, if the illustrations they give in their preaching, all lies and the things they tell in the marriage committee all lies and the things they say and they say well i'm just trying to encourage them and you know and then they'll say you know they'll say somebody in fact i counseled that person and i knew that person and actually let me tell you the story then they'll fabricate a story and they will say i'm telling you the truth this is the person that i saw and actually you know if you go this direction this is what will happen this is what happened to that person religious lies and uh, you might make the fellow afraid of what he wants to do by telling him that lie and he doesn't understand. And he too will go and repeat the lie. That's why you need to be careful in these days we are living, my brothers and sisters. When people tell you things, don't spread it. Don't spread it. Because you know sometimes somebody will tell you something and, and you think they're telling you the truth. And these are just religious lies. Religious lies. And they will, they will fabricate everything. Everything will look logical. Then they give it to you. And then you say, ah, my brother, let me tell you. And then husband and wife, my dear sister, you know, you get your husband at home. You say, my husband, I had something. Let me tell you. And without knowing, you are repeating their lies. You are spreading their lies. That's why you need to be careful because there are a lot of religious liars today. In Ezekiel chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 22. Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 22. Because with lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad. With lies, the preachers, the prophets, the dreamers, the prayer warriors, the counselors, the marriage leaders. With lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad. Whom I have not made sad and strengthened the hands of the wicked. That they should not return. From his wicked way by promising him lie and then there's professional lying professional lying you want the manager to love you you'll say whatever he tells you to say you want our sectional leader to love you just say what he told you to say and you want uh, you know your coordinator to love you and the the, the leaders to love you don't, don't prove too righteous don't put extra over righteous are you better than you know what they are are you better than them are you better than our leaders our leaders told us that's what to say what are you investigating what are you finding out before you will repeat what they told you to say are you better than them 
professional lines. Say what they told you to say and go your way and get out of trouble. But he's going to be condemned by the Lord. It tells us in Hosea chapter 7 verse 3. Hosea chapter 7 verse 3. They make the king glad with their wickedness and the princes with their lies. They make the princes happy, joyful, glad. You are a good boy. You are a good girl. You are doing well. It, you said what we told you to say. They make the princes happy, glad with their lies. And as you come to Revelation chapter 14, Revelation chapter 14, you see what the Lord is telling us. That these people, they are the redeemed of the Lord. And as the redeemed of the Lord, there was no lie in their mouth. And then it tells us very clearly that they are without fault before the throne of God. The reason why the Lord is revealing all these things to us is that the Lord himself wants to purge us and he will purge us. He wants to cleanse us and he will cleanse us until there will be no fault, there will be no sin in our lives anymore. In Jesus' name, in Jude verse 24, Jude verse 24, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. The Lord has the power to keep you from falling. You will not fall into defilement and you will not fall into anything that will defile you, that will destroy your virginity, that will destroy your, your righteousness, your purity. You will not fall into anything that will make you an unloyal unlawful compromising disciple you'll not fall into anything that will destroy and model up the redemption the lord has given you and then you there'll be no girl there'll be no lying in your mouth and the blood of jesus is able to cleanse and purify and purge you unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise god our savior it be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever and everybody said amen, amen. let's rise up and talk to the lord and say lord i've read about these people saved sanctified purified and there was no fault in their lives it was in a sinful society and yet they were saved and it will be in a corrupt society there yet they'll be sanctified in a horrible place and yet they'll be holy uh, under unlimited persecution and yet they're going to be uncompromising it will be a time of tribulation in the world yet they're going to be triumphant it will be at a time of suffering in society and yet they're going to be sealed and protected from the power of the antichrist and from the power of the beast and from the power of the dragon if the lord will do that for them at the time of the great tribulation he can do it for you today he can do it for you today you talk to the lord and say lord i want to be saved if you are saved i want to be sanctified if you are backsliding i want to be restored if you are not holy i want to be holy if you have been compromising and yielding they tell you to tell lies to act out lies to dramatize lies and you're doing it tell the lord i want to be serious and sober i want to follow the lord and i want to be a real child of god standing triumphant and overcomer sealed and protected uncompromising in my life the lord is able to keep you from falling from falling into sin and if you'll call upon the lord today the blood of jesus christ is still flowing and it is still powerful and it is still mighty and it will the blood of jesus will wash you whiter than snow you'll never be the same again and should the rapture take place anytime should the trumpet sound anytime then you'll go with the redemption